I wanted to go back to another uh, very practical uh, suggestion that you make in your book, legal, legal Writing, A Judge's Perspective, and that is to use descriptive headings in your brief. Uh, this is on page 26. You're citing uh, uh, more studies from psycholinguistics uh, that state that uh, the, the multiple studies have demonstrated that headings assist readers' mental organization of upcoming paragraphs. So as a judge who reads briefs, uh, how important is it to you to see a well-organized and articulated table of contents with headings? It's very important. Um, and, you know, if I see uh, a brief uh, or a judicial opinion that is, you know, Roman numeral one, background, number two, discussion uh, or analysis, three, conclusion. Um, I feel that uh, it, it just is, a, is an opportunity that is bypassed. Uh, there's a, a, an example in the, in the book that I think I used of, uh, from Gregory Garr in a case called U.S. versus Zuckerman. Uh, where he's arguing that a $10 million fine is substantively unreasonable. And if you just track, I don't know Greg Regar, but if you track his headings, they're all simple declarative sentences. You don't have to word, read a word of prose and you know what his argument is, that, uh, that, it's, uh, that it's in excess of the applicable guideline fine without any compelling justification, et cetera. And you go through these headings and you know what his argument is. And so when you read under Roman numeral one or 2A or 3A1, you know what you're looking for. And so it's so intuitive. It is borne out by, uh, by psycholinguists that tell us that in formative headings, there's a study that I think that I referred to by a uh, team of linguists, Robert Elizabeth Lorch, and uh, another study by Robert uh, Lorch and Iona that have said that informative headings aid the reader's ability to recall what they have read. And, and, and there's another study that shows that it enhances the reader's ability to summarize the content of, of what they have uh, read. And, and I think that those, you know, ex those, those studies are just really common sense that if you read a heading that that flags the point that the author is trying to make in that section, that 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 will provide a valuable tool to the reader. And I don't know why the Supreme Court ever uh, created this this convention of we're just gonna we're gonna try to make it as esoteric as possible. We're gonna say one, two, two a. <laughs> we're not even gonna use any any words. We're just going to try to make it as opaque as possible. Uh, and and it's, the D.C. Circuit utilizes it, a number of judges utilize it. And again, I'm not a critic of other judges. Right. I'm just saying for me, it's just, you know, I just think we use everything that we can legitimately use to try to make it as easy to understand as we can. And the more opaque that we make headings, the more we're defeating our ends of trying to make our prose as judges or advocates easy to understand. In your experience, are most attorneys making use of well-organized tables of contents and well-articulated headings, or are they? Is this an unmined vein? It is an un, it is unmined, and I and I, I, I haven't really uh, uh, thought too much about the percentage, but on a, roughly, I would say it's about half and half. Tim, don't tell our opponents. They'll start using the table contents effectively and be better advocates. It's better that we just use effective table contents and our opponents never do. We'll edit this part out. <laughs>